Greetings friends, Gemini Brett here with the 11th video in this Stellarium Planetarium Software for Astrologers instructional series, the 2023 edition. We today are going to explore the very important sky and viewing options menu, which is going to help us make our Stellarium look more like an astrology chart. All right, we've got a couple things um, one to one already, like the place you'll remember early in this series, we added a place that wasn't in the database like El Sobrante, California, uh, date and time, right? So that's all fixed. I've stopped the chart here a minute ago at February 20th, 2023, 7.30 a.m. El Sobrante, California. The sun has just recently risen followed by moon happy new moon y'all um, and we could see that here if we can take the atmosphere away by clicking this button or the keyboard shortcut a and there's the sun with the moon following just behind moon right on the horizon at this time which isn't quite shown here unless you know how to read lunar latitude based upon the moon's aspect to the lunar nodes, or we could get it into um, a points list here in Astro Gold. Astrology software, we actually checked that out, the moon's altitude, which is here, maybe I have to hide my camera to show that, zero, right? That means the moon is on the ground. That's pretty cool. That might change a little bit with parallax, but either way, we're seeing that pretty true here in Stellarium that the moon is just crossing the horizon. Let me take the ground away and look at that. The center of the moon on the horizon line, amazing. By the way, the horizon isn't something that might have shown up in your Stellarium yet. It's the keyboard shortcut H is the default. I usually leave that one for the keyboard shortcut. We're gonna find how we can turn that on and off in the sky and viewings menu. Okay, so we've got the clock time to be the same 7 30 a.m february 20th 2023 i'm here in el sobrante california which earlier in the series i said is my default location and so we have those elements of our chart equal right but uh where's the wheel <laughs> all right the circumference of the chart is the ecliptic plane it is the path that earth takes about the sun and therefore from earth's point of view the path that the sun takes around us every year. It's the heart of the zodiac. And since our solar system is relatively flat, the planets also travel along this ecliptic too. So when we find the ecliptic button, we're gonna see something that travels <laughs> right through the sun or the sun travels on and that we'll find Mercury and Saturn, Moon, Venus and Jupiter very close. Given that the moon is not at one of her nodes, Lunar nodes are the points from Earth's point of view where the path of the moon crosses the path of the sun. And given the moon is not conjunct to the north node nor the south node, we see that the moon has some latitude. We can actually see here in Stellarium or Astro Gold astrology software at the time that the moon's latitude is minus four and a half degrees. So that means the moon is currently about four, well, and a third degree south of the ecliptic plane. I'd love to be able to see that. I'd love to also show the moon's orbital path. Let's go. Okay, so I'm gonna bring the ground beneath our feet again. Let's stay grounded along the way, friends. I just wanna note, I didn't in the last kind of pop-up video about adding asteroids, comets, and adjusting their orbital elements. Um, in the video before, I had noticed that the deep sky object backgrounds here was on and I wanted that to be off. Um, so I turned it off and then I went to configuration menu, save settings. And this is the first time where I noticed that actually took. Now, now I just save settings with the clock up. Okay. It's when I open Stellarium again, and let me just show you this. I believe the clock will be up on the screen and down in the lower right corner, just like that. 
And as I've said many times and will continue to say, apparently actually the clock is not part of this because the clock's not there at all, right? And when I click the clock, it'll show up where it was. But I was wrong in assuming that saving my settings would include whether the clock is kind of on screen or not. That's apparently not part of this world, okay? But I've said before and I'll say again, this save settings menu or button, which is in the configuration windows menu on the main page is one of your best friends. We're gonna be making a lot of changes along the way today to help the sky here in planetarium astronomy software, Stellarium planetarium software look like your astrology chart. All right, and we'll wanna save settings along the way. I'm gonna stop time. F5 brings up the time menu. I'm going to stick with uh, 7.30 a.m., which is the chart that I have over here, and we'll just get them to look similar. Okay. So let's go to the sky and viewing options window. As with all of these large menus in Stellarium, there are many different sub-menus that we can move through by clicking these different icons or tabs at the top of the menu. Okay, so the first one is sky. Um, it's a lot here, okay? So one, Milky Way brightness and saturation. Okay, let me click that. And now you see the Milky Way came on the screen. Okay, this is the galactic center actually right here. All right, so look, click that box and it goes away. Click that box and it comes on the screen. And um, brightness. So I can increase the brightness of the Milky Way. You're seeing that happen real time, right? Saturation is um, going to saturate the color. Okay, so we, I mean, we have a pretty, pretty bright Milky Way on here. I love the Milky Way. I wish I lived in a dark sky space where I can see the Milky Way like that. I've certainly photographed it like that. And there's already a lot of color there. Watch when I go down here in saturation. It's basically going to turn it black and white, right? If I go up, the um, default setting was one. Then we're going to go up. Oh, you know what? That's the highest. One is the highest. So I have between one and zero around... Um, coloration <laughs> of the Milky Way. I don't think that's a word. Anyway, look, we can go way bright. I wonder what the limits are here. I mean, it gets overwhelming, right? Like that's ridiculous. I'm up in the eights now. I like three. Um, that's what the Milky Way looks like in a place that I wish I lived. Okay. So, you know, set those accordingly. And again, here to turn the Milky Way on and off. All right, zodiacal light brightness. Um, zodiacal light, I don't feel like explaining right now. We have other things to do, but I encourage you to go look online around what zodiacal light is. Look for it in your sky. Do you see how it comes in? Just watch what changes when I bring that in and out. You know, I'm, I, I kind of prefer it to be out. I just get a kind of crisper scene in Stellarium. Having the zodiacal light button selected will be more like your view outside. Um, also, um, same with light pollution, right? Light pollution is currently manual. Look how I can turn that up and down, right? Like if I have tons of city lights, you can even see the ground outside at night. I'm always like amazed when I walk the dog at nighttime sometimes and we get down to a park over here. There's just a field where there's no lights at all. And suddenly like I can see that the like a full moon is bright and changes things like most places in my neighborhood. It doesn't matter if the moon is full or new. It's just street light, you know. So, um, so having light pollution manual is cool. And as you can see, there's a slider menu here. Okay. So if we want to go like super dark sky, like out in the desert, just having it all the way down is super sweet. Obviously matching our chart, um, <laughs> which shows everything regardless of light pollution, we maybe want that all the way down. We're still not going to see, oh, 
some of the things that show up on the chart anyway. So, you know, that's up to you. If you want your Stellarium to match what you're experiencing outside, you can find kind of the right place here on this um, light pollution slider. Um, okay, what about dynamic eye ad adaptation? I don't know what that is, actually. I mean, you know what I, I would guess it is that when we go outside from like a lit room, for example, it takes a while for your eyes to adjust to the night sky. And as you're out there for a bit, you start actually literally seeing more stars as your eyes adjust. Dynamic means changing, dynamic eye adaptation. Maybe that's like the adjustment of your eyes when you first walk outside. I mean, it'd be interesting to see if like, is it after the sun sets because dynamic eye adaptation is selected, then more stars slowly start to appear on the screen. I don't know. I'm going to unclick zodiacal light brightness. I'm going to unclick dynamic eye adaptation. There's um, atmosphere visualization. Well, that just turned the atmosphere on. Let's look at what, anytime you see the monkey wrench, it's a configuration menu. Let's see what the options are there. Refraction settings. Okay, so due to your atmospheric pressure, your temperature, your extinction coefficient, <laughs> we can click standard atmosphere. Okay, um, that's going to change some of your experience of the sky. Actually, when you see the sun or the moon rise, for example, what's this button do? Custom settings for tone mapping. That's beyond my pay grade. I'm going to leave it off. Actually, our astrology charts do not um, adjust for uh, atmospheric visualization. All right, nor light pollution. I'm going to keep that slid all the way down. I'm already seeing these things bounce around a little bit. So I'm going to go to my configuration window, main menu, save settings right now. All right. Solar altitude for twilight finder. What? <laughs> okay, right. So what that's saying is um, if the sun is this minus six degrees, right? When the sun is six degrees beneath the horizon, twilight begins. I'm going to shift from dark sky to starting to lose stars in my sky. Let's test that. I'm going to select the sun here. And we can see that the sun's current altitude is positive six. Okay, I'm going to have to turn on the atmosphere to show this. And I'm going to hit the J key, which rewinds time. I'm going to go a few kind of fast rewind. And here's the sun. I'm going to stop time there, or the K key goes one second per second, kind of real time adjustment. The sun's at minus 17 degrees altitude. G key takes the ground away, and there's the sun down beneath the ground. All right, well, what is this solar altitude for twilight finder? I had noticed I'm hitting L now to speed time up. You can see the sky spinning. Here's the sun at minus 15 degrees. Just keep your eyes here on altitude. It feels to me like we're already experiencing some twilight. I'm noticing that atmospheric visualization box is checked. So I guess just me turning the atmosphere on and off with either that icon down on the bottom menu bar or the A key is going to shift that. Here's sun at negative eight degrees and we can see that sun rising sky. Let's see when we get to six. Let me stop time there. I don't know. I didn't notice that solar altitude for twilight finder and it didn't do what i thought i'm gonna go down to like 12 degrees here and let's rewind time and see if it's a much different experience then i'm gonna select the sun we had started at 17 negative 17 degrees altitude 17 degrees below the ground before that's like there and let's see if um the experience shifts now that we changed that solar altitude for twilight finder from negative six to negative 12. Um, 
I think it's the same. No, you know what? There's more stars in the sky as the sun's rising. <laughs> okay, that actually, for me, is counterintuitive. It's opposite of what I had expected. But there's a couple of things I want to test here. I'm going to hit A to turn the atmosphere off. I got to be clicked into Stellarium, not in a menu. Okay, I'm going to hit A. And then we just see atmospheric visualization, visualization gets unchecked. I don't know what this thing did. I saw some kind of shift that actually worked in the opposite direction than what I thought. You know what, let's turn it to a positive number and just see. I'm gonna set it to zero. And then I'm gonna set this to positive six. I can't, zero is the minimum. So let's do that same experiment with that thing set to zero. We need to have the atmosphere on. I'm bringing the sun back down like 17 degrees below. And we're gonna go do the sunrise thing from there. Uh, yeah, the stars went away more quickly. Maybe you noticed that. Let's go to like negative 10 on here. I can't. We were at negative six. See how, how low can you go? Well, we were at negative 12, weren't we? Can I go to negative 20? Okay, let's do that. Select the sun again, or rewind time, get it down beneath the horizon some, bring the ground back down beneath my feet, turn the atmosphere on and hit the L key a few times to get sunrise happening in my guess now. I thought we were going to see more stars stay on screen. I have no idea what this is doing. Sorry to waste your time experimenting. I'm going to turn that back to negative six, which was its default. Um, you can see here, that was just the A key. I'm clicking A key to take the atmosphere away, okay? And then I'm going to go back to my chart time. So um, eight, remember, goes to now. Seven will stop the clock. And I was in my chart, I'm at 7.30 a.m. So I'm just adjusting the clock in the lower right of the screen. Okay. Um, shooting stars. So you can, you know, crank this bar all the way up and then you're going to see shooting stars cruise across your screen quite randomly. Obviously, they can't predict actual <laughs> shooting stars. Um, I don't really need shooting stars on my screen, so I'm just turning that to zero, which seemed to be the default, actually. All right. Um, yeah, speaking of stars, let's go through this kind of menu on the upper right before we get into this menu on the lower left, okay? So, first of all, there's a stars button. I can turn the stars on and off. All right. Absolute scale. So, um, in relative scale, star twinkle, All right? Do you want your stars twinkling? Let's see what happens if I crank that up. Are we actually going to notice the stars twinkling more? I can only turn it up from one to, it goes between zero and 1.5. Who knows what the scale is? I'm not personally noticing anything on this small laptop screen without reading glasses on. <laughs> Maybe you are. Limit magnitude. Look what happens when I click that button. All right. Well, not much, but it's also because 6.5, positive 6.5, that's like super dim stars. I mean, maybe at the edge of your naked eye view if you're in super dark sky spaces and you know with some light pollution settings well i thought that would take some stars away it's not um this one's probably a button you can push to there's a couple of things that this for me is doing i mean you can see as i'm limiting the magnitude and bringing it down to lower magnitudes okay let's like do two now, basically, you're only seeing the stars that are currently labeled here, all right? 
Um, there's a very bright stars, like magnitude stars are definitely naked eye stars, even in New York City at night, okay? Um, it's, you know, having less stars on screen is actually a, a, maybe a better way to not only map what you're seeing outside, but to start to learn to see the constellations. However, look at like the priestess constellation here. Right. If I'm only showing Vindia Matrix and Spica, right, Spica has a magnitude of 0.95. That's very bright. All right. The magnitude scale is so weird. The lower it goes and it can get into negative zone like, oh, the sun is a magnitude of negative 27. All right. The lower it goes, the brighter the object. So currently Mercury, not because the sun is up, but currently Mercury at negative 0.33 actually has a brighter magnitude than Spica, but good luck seeing Mercury because Mercury is so close to the sun right now. It's not happening, okay? But regardless, this idea of magnitude is the lower you go, the brighter the star. So with Spica at 0.95, and Arcturus at 0.15, Arcturus is one of the brightest stars in the sky. That's true for Vega as well up here, Vega at zero. Maybe Vega is the standard for the scale that some call, I think, Caparcus is his great curse, like this weird magnitude thing that not only has negative is brighter or lesser is brighter, but it's not even a linear scale. It's some kind of logarithmic scale. It's like this weird thing that, as you can hear, I don't quite understand, okay? Anyway, when I see the priestess constellation in my sky, and I'm just north of Oakland, California, it's pretty light polluted. I see at least this trapezoid of stars in Vindia Matrix. I actually can see stars that are right here that are much dimmer, Zaniya and Zavi Java. So I'm going to set this thing to look like my personal sky experience, which is maybe in this four zone. I'm going to go 4.4 4 because it looks good. Can I do 4.44? 4? It's done. All right, that's the setting I'm going for. I encourage you to adjust that. You know, if you live in a super dark sky place, you probably either don't want to limit the magnitude. So look what happens when I unclick that box. All of these other stars show up. But as you're starting to learn the stars in astrology, we work a lot with so-called fixed stars um, like Antares and Spica and Arcturus, but also like Porima and Zaniya and Zavi Java and the like. Zavi Java actually I'm noticing is not on here right now. So maybe I want... I can barely see Zavi Java, which just came on the screen. Huh, maybe not. Where is Zavi Java? Maybe a star that I think is Zavi Java that I'm seeing in the sky is not. Well, we learned how I can just hit Command F, right? And then search for Zavi Java. Said the keyboard shortcuts took over. Oh, interesting. It's much lower than the priestess constellation. That's Zavi Java. I feel like I've been misdiagnosing that star. I'm going to go back to 4.4 .4 and it's still there. No, it's the one I'm seeing. I've just been drawing my priestess constellation differently than is drawn here in Stellarium, which is using this magnitude four star up here. Zavi Java, much brighter. Well, not much. 3.55. Okay. These videos are obviously longer than they need to be <laughs> because of my tangential um, walking through the woods like this, but hopefully that's helpful for you too. All right, so absolute scale of stars. Um, I think that if I unclick limit magnitude, we're going to see some difference when we change the absolute scale. Um, so 
For example, one thing I noticed that is that Minilalva here, which has um, a magnitude of 3.35, I might have to go into my configurations window and into the information and choose to display absolute magnitude as well as visual magnitude. So we see Minilalva has an absolute magnitude of negative 0.47. Hmm. I thought maybe something we would notice here is that when this absolute scale maybe mirrored that number, then Minilalva gets displayed i don't know here's porama at 3.4 i'm going to click the limit magnitude again you can see how many stars just went away but interestingly something about the absolute scale which was originally set to one has stars that were not labeled then receive a label you can hear my confusion around what's going on there. I mean, these are things where I'm going to have to go read in Stellarium what it is. Now I'm changing relative scale. So I guess that would be a star's brightness compared to other stars. And one thing I notice is that I, as I increase that Zosma here, as far as the label goes, went away. I'm also noticing that I'm, as I'm um, increasing that, stars are getting brighter, right? So maybe these actually just kind of add to the um, kind of like expected visual so I could show them a bit more. As far as teaching goes, I mean, it's odd. As I'm, as I'm going down, now we're having more stars show up <laughs> in relative scale. If I go up here in absolute scale, more star labels are showing up. <laughs> what? Doesn't that kind of feel counterintuitive? Um, but one thing I'm kind of digging here is how when I increase relative scale, the sprite stars are getting bigger. Maybe all stars are getting bigger. And while I want to mirror my sky experience out there, it's also helpful for when I'm like teaching constellations for them to be a little bit brighter. So I'm just kind of looking at this. The default was one and one, right? That was this. I'm going up to one point. Two five one and one point two five. Do what you do. Again, stars will take them all away. Do I need twinkle? I still have not yet noticed anything twinkling. Um, limit magnitude. If I take that away, so many stars appear. I want to kind of match my local experience. More of my local experience. So that's at four point four four. Spiky stars. That's kind of cool. Like, look at how Spica now looks spiky. Let me click that again. My experience in the sky with my naked eye is not spiky at all, but rather round. And I also need to try it. Well, I'm not usually creating my lessons on this computer, but I want to keep it somewhat similar to what I teach in my lessons. So. It's going to be good for me to go review where my settings are on my desktop and maybe remember that because, you know, if I have an animation and then I go to another one and the sky looks totally different, I don't know, maybe less ideal. Okay, labels and markers you can see as a slider. So, by the way, spiky stars, like if I'm taking photos of the stars and I have like a um, wide, a, a, a large f-stop, which is narrowing the aperture of my camera, then you get this kind of like that spiky view. But I'm I'm leaving that off. You do what you do. Okay, labels and markers. First of all, I can just turn them off. So see Spica here? Now it's not labeled at all. I usually keep star labels off because when I'm um when I'm trying to match a chart. I'm not typically showing all those so-called fixed stars in my wheel. 
that can be helpful, especially as you're learning the stars, and this is where you find it, right? So labels and markers, I can also crank this up, all right? So that just got overwhelming, right? So one thing we saw is that we were adjusting absolute scale and relative scale. That would change how many stars are labeled. But here I can also just go to the slider. And, you know, I like, you know, Zubin el Janubi, Zubin el Shamali, yet all of these stars that are now labeled are very visible, naked eye and my sky out here. And so, I mean, we might want to match that. I mean, even I can see these stars of Dolphinus, which is a pretty dim constellation. Now, obviously, this is like overwhelming, right? If we're zoomed in, maybe less so. And if we're learning star names, cool. But I'm going to keep my thing down here for now. So we get very bright stars labeled, and that's it. Do what you do. Show additional star names, and that's an interesting place for that to be. If you, you'll remember if you've been going through all these videos with me, in the configuration window, we could have name. Okay, so let me click this star, which is Alpha. It's a star that's shared by a couple of constellations, um, it's, but it's of the great square of Pegasus. Now, having the name on will show me the name of the star, but that thing in the parentheses, Sarah, the, somehow that's over here. That seems like it should be in the information of the configuration window. But anyway, show additional star names. You see the parentheses went away. So for stars like Arcturus, sorry, Antares we'll go with. Antares. But when I'm here and show additional star names, Cor Scorpii, Vespertilio, Kalb al Akrab. You know, like, frankly, I make a lot of like screenshots and illustrations and animations and whatever for my Astronomy for Astrologers courses. I wish I knew where this button was before. I've seen it before, but I usually end up like doing all sorts of things just so I can like block that out. So anyway, yeah, I, Antares is enough for me personally. I think this is great for our education. Again, you do what you do, but this is where you find that button. Now I've made so many changes here. I want to go to the configuration window, main screen, save settings. All right. And let's just see, actually, if I quit Stellarium and I open up Stellarium again, Will all of those star settings we just made take? Well, I can see that I had the ground away. So let me put the ground back beneath my feet. And then I'm going to go to configuration, save settings, close. I'm quitting Stellarium to test it, opening Stellarium again. And there's the ground beneath our feet as a saved setting. Again, save settings in the configuration window. Main down in the lower middle is a very good friend of yours. Okay. Let me go to sky and viewing options. Okay, and then we see those settings I just made. 1 and 1.25 1 and 1.5 on the twinkle, you know, I'm going to go back to one, I think was the default spiky stars is off show additional star names, which was default selected is now unselected so that if I click on Arcturus, I'm not getting all of this. Oh, I guess Arcturus is only Arcturus, but Antares, right, I'm not getting all of these other names. Oh, well, I'm not on Antares, am I? Altair and Atair. Okay, now just Altair. Great. Use designations for screen labels. Double stars. Variable stars. HIP. Well, one thing I noticed is that, like, Arcturus, as soon as I click that, is now called Alpha Butes or Vega, Alpha Lyra, or Altair, Alpha Aquila, like those are those star names, right? If I click on, um, oh, Unukalai, we're gonna see, well, we're not gonna see its star name. How about Rosso? 
No. This one should be alpha Ophiuchus. Maybe if I slide this thing up, yeah, then we see that. So, I mean, this is actually cool. I'm glad to know where this is because as I'm like looking at star lists, sometimes things are just written in this way, like alpha, beta, etc. cetera. Um, but I don't want that on as a default. I'd rather see the star names. So there you go. All right, we're almost done with the first <laughs> submenu of our sky and viewings options. Uh, we have one more area of the submenu to observe, which is about our observation and how we're seeing the sky or really projecting this apparently spherical experience when we go outside onto a flat screen. So the default projection is stereographic and I can shift to a fisheye. Orthographic is an interesting one. That's a very interesting one to me. A friend that prefers that, I don't get it because it really is, doesn't seem to be what I'm seeing outside. I mean, maybe because I am experiencing kind of a, no. Yeah, the stereographic, I feel like, kind of fits my experience outside, depending on how far zoomed in I am, right? Because I could never, let me zoom out, see south, look south and see east and west at the same time, right? But our charts let us do that. Like this chart is, this is southeast and this is northwest, pretty close to the cardinal directions, and this is due south. Um, so... It's there's a difference between do I want to like mirror my personal experiential um, star work when I step outside or do I want to mirror the chart and I kind of go back and forth. Okay, so as you, you I mean you can just play with these different settings like the Miller cylindrical you can see that some of them like really distort when you're way zoomed out. Um, or, but maybe look quite natural when you're zoomed in. The truth is the sky does kind of distort or the constellations look larger when they're on the horizon than in the sky. I, I just find the default stereographic does pretty well. I'm seeing this, there's a maximum field of view of 235 degrees, right? I mean, that's pretty huge. With the circle is 360, right? Let's go fisheye, that probably increases. Yeah, with fisheye, you can go 360. I'm wondering what that looks like. I zoomed out and now this is north, I guess. Yeah, I can see the meridian. <laughs> that's odd, right? So that's part of the um, projections is like how much of a field of view you can set it to. Like orthographic, you only get 180 equal area you can go 360 etc okay there's one up front called perspective where the maximum is 120 that's interesting i mean apparently and just listening to the title of it as well that probably is limited to the human experience also you get this kind of stretching of ophiuchus up here now watch if i look up see ophiuchus is going to be like more quote unquote, normally shaped, right? So as I'm looking around, you're gonna see how the um, kind of shapes of the constellations will stretch and compress and the like. <laughs> Look at that, like even Northeast and Northwest get tilty when I'm looking North. That's intriguing. And the North and East are tilty when I look at Northeast. Tilty is a highly technical term, is it not? Um, okay, I want to look south. Here in the northern hemisphere, the meridian midheaven is always due south. And I should say in every northern hemisphere location north of the Tropic of Cancer and south of the Antar or Arctic Circle. So perspective, I think, is intriguing. Um, but I'm going to stick with the stereographic Oops, I went to the wrong menu. I want the sky and viewing options menu. I'm sticking with stereographic, which is the default. Now you can see some other settings down here, um, which is view, 
vertical viewpoint offset. So look, as I'm increasing that, yeah, I mean, you can see what's happening, kind of the altitude's changing. Now, oh, that's interesting. I mean, maybe what if I'm looking from a very tall building versus from looking the, at the ground level? Is that <clears throat> going to change my experience of the sky from one particular location? Or is this just basically mapping my camera or my telescopes on a tripod? It's facing five degrees up. So set this five degrees up. I don't know. I'm leaving it at zero. And you can see here a custom field of view limit. It's interesting because the maximum field of view for stereographic is 235. What if I kick that in? Is it going to let me go? Zoom to 360. You can see, by the way, field of view down here. See how it says field of view 235? So this seemed to do nothing. <laughs> and I don't know, you know, maybe in different views or something, but okay, we're done with this. Great. So we have finished our journey through only the first tab of the sky and viewing options menu. Um, I'm going to make sure before we move on, I save my settings. So configuration menu, main, save settings. And close that. And let's go to our next tab. SSO, solar system objects, obviously hugely important for astrologers because this is planets. Use more accurate 3D models where available. Why not? One of my guesses is that might slow Stellarium down a little bit, but you can see that another option was default selected as soon as I selected that, which was simulate self-shadowing. What is self-shadowing? Well, consider that like half of Earth is always in Earth's own or self-shadow. Let's go and um, look at Mercury now. We'll zoom way in. As I zoom way in on Mercury, huh. Now Mercury just looks like a bright ball, usually in Stellarium. Yeah, I just had to go a little further. Oh, I also need to stop time with the seven key. I want to open up the, well, I'll do that later. So look at Mercury's now, right? So you can see this shadow line on Mercury, right? Mercury's here to the uh, west of the sun. And so the eastern side of Mercury's illuminated from Earth's point of view. Um, we can't see Mercury anyways, it's too close to the light. But either way, let's go back to those sky and viewing options menu. And let me unclick that, use more accurate. Let's do a couple of things. If I unclick simulate self shadow, well, I thought that was going to change it so that Mercury would be fully illuminated. Nothing is happening with either of these. I can click the solar system objects and Mercury goes away. Um, but it seems maybe with Mercury, it doesn't matter whether or not I have this use more accurate, accurate 3D models on. Seems to be using a pretty accurate 3D model with cratering and all this. And it's showing the self shadow regardless. So I don't know. Show planetary nomenclature. Oh, that's cool. So we have named many of these craters on Mercury, like Antares Rupes, right? So, and then look at that bright green. You can see it's the same color as what's being shown here. I can click that square. I'm not sure if this is the same in PC as it is in Mac. Like this is a pretty standard Mac thing. But look what happens if I click light blue and hit OK. Now those are labeled in light blue. Um, I'm not going to turn that on, but it's nice to remember where that is if I ever get to the level of studying planetary crater names. Certainly on the moon, I'm getting more and more interested in that because it's something I can see, and especially as I photograph the moon. I, I don't have a telescope. like I can't get Mercury to this level, and I'm learning so many things about Mercury, but I don't know that I'm ready to learn Mercury's crater names personally. Maybe you are, so there you go. Um, Hide nomenclature of the celestial body of observer. Okay, let's click that on and then click that off. I don't know. 
only for solar elevation. Only so limiting things show spectral nomenclature points only south pole west i mean that's kind of cool actually i'm really interested in learning where the north and south pole of the different planets are so i'm happy to know where to go to find that i'm also not going to use it um i'm intrigued by the more accurate 3D model. Maybe we're just gonna have to try some other planets. In fact, let's try one now. Oh, Saturn's in the sky currently. Let's go find Saturn. So I'm gonna go Command F and just click Saturn here and then return. Okay, let's see what happens if I go use more accurate. I'm seeing no change. What about you? What if we try Prometheus as one of Saturn's? I seemingly cannot zoom in on Prometheus. Maybe I need to search Prometheus. Oops. Keyboard shortcuts just took over. Oh, I went to the asteroid Prometheus and I found its orbital elements are outdated. Consider updating. We saw how to do that in our last video. All right, well, I, all that's maybe way beyond scope here. Let's get back on track. Show orbits. Okay, this is a great button to know. I'm surprised to see it default elected. Um, we need to click on a planet or a moon to show that truth. So, yeah, but you just saw when I unclicked, all of these things came in. Now, it's default unselected, so I didn't remember clicking that box. Maybe it was clicked when I chose to use more accurate models. Did I click it by accident? Did it show up maybe when I selected Mercury or Saturn? I mean, we can test that. I click on Mercury, it didn't show up. I don't know, okay? But I'm gonna click that show orbits, and now you can see Mercury's orbital path. That's gonna be so much more helpful to talk about that once I can put the ecliptic on. Um, and in fact, you know what? I'm just gonna jump ahead. We'll get back here, but I'm going to markings tab here, and I'm gonna click the ecliptic. Ecliptic, not grid just the ecliptic of date. Okay, that's the sun's path. And now we can see how Mercury's path, from our point of view, is kind of circling around, sorry, ell ellipsing around the sun. Let me click on Saturn. Different story for Saturn's path. We see Saturn able to go opposite the sun in our sky. So Saturn's path, like the sun's path or the heart of the zodiac, is gonna look like a full circle. Now it's interrupted by the ground, okay? And for me to see the part that's below the ground in a way that maybe looks more reasonable, I've got to turn around. I think you'll notice that as I was moving, it disappeared Saturn's path, which was red off screen. And the reason why is um, as soon as Saturn's off my screen, as he just is, now I can't see Saturn's path either, okay? Now, I'm only looking at Saturn's path instead of all the paths because you can see underneath show orbits, there is an option here for only orbits of major planets. Obviously, that's going to have Saturn on, but also only orbit for selected object. If I unclick that, Now I'm showing all of these planets orbital paths. Let me click on Mercury. I don't know, that seems to be defaulting to only orbit for selected object. There's some things that here that don't seem to be computing, okay? Interesting. Um, look at this one. I imagine if I increase that, you can see Mercury's orbital path here is like increased in thickness, right? That's kind of cool. I like three. What's this monkey wrench button do? Oh, interesting. Okay, so that's a big deal. <laughs> so do we want to do this here? Yeah, I mean, just 
just a little bit. So show orbits, I don't know what permanently means, like that means they're just always on. Show orbits box selected will mean that they're always on too. And by the way, there's a keyboard shortcut for this, which is O. See them come on and off. This um, four is too thick for me. I'm going to two. I'm going to go to the monkey wrench. And first and foremost, at the top here, you can see one color for all orbits. I'd rather not have that. Select colors for orbits by object type. Okay, well, if I select that, um, I can see orbits of major planets is red. Okay, but how about separate colors for orbits of major planets only? This is the one that I actually end up using. Let me show you what happens when I click that. Now Mercury's got this kind of silver thing and Earth is blue. That's odd because I'm looking from Earth. That You know what? Can we go to Mars and Stellarium? Huh. That's odd to me. And you can see that Neptune and Uranus are both different levels of blue also. These I like to change. For me, I work with Venus and I like these. I don't love neon colors, but I like that they show up well. I go kind of bright green for Venus. I like bright blue for Mercury, like that. Maybe a super electric blue for Uranus, like that. Neptune's kind of darker blue here is fine with me, something like that. I like orange for Jupiter or purple. Um, and so I want to go this, you know, actually kind of, well, what, what they have for Jupiter is pretty close to what I use for the sun. So, or the ecliptic. So I'm not sure I'm going to go like more orange for Jupiter. Um, for Mars, obviously very bright red. Come on now. Saturn lead <laughs> but lead's not going to show up against space so usually i'll go a little more kind of gray here for saturn I, I might i might adjust that okay now sadly you cannot um select a custom image for the moon i like for the moon's orbital path to be kind of white so for me to do that i actually have to either you know i may have to just kind of group generic orbit and i'm going to make that white okay so separate colors for orbits of major planets only i choose white for generic orbit unfortunately that's going to have the moon's orbit and all the orbits of plutinos dwarf planets minor planets sednoids comets etc show up as white because this is separate colors for orbits by objectal type. If I do that, all the planets are gonna be whatever I have for major planets here. And maybe I'll just select purple to show that that's true, right? But if I go separate colors for orbits of major planets only, then I get this whole palette, you know, for the different planets. And I can select one color for everything else, which includes moon. Right, obviously in astrology, we're most concerned with moon and then the planets or moon and the other planet paths, maybe I would say. Okay, so let me find the moon now. I'll just go Command F and make sure I'm clicked in here and just go moon, bam. All right, well, as I zoom in on the moon, Click O to turn orbital pass on. Hmm. They're not showing me the orbital path of the moon. So there's something in my settings that I want to change. Only orbits of major planets. I want to unclick that. And now I have the moon's path. Okay. And one of the keys there is that now I can see the lunar nodes. I have to have the moon on screen for that same reason I shared before of, um, Saturn's path disappearing when I looked around and Saturn was no longer on the Stellarium screen. But with the ecliptic, which is the path of the sun or the heart of the zodiac shown, and I'm going to increase the, um, the width of that quickly. 
should get back to where and how you do that, but you probably just saw it. Now, where I see the moon's path crossing the sun's path, well, that's a lunar node. Specifically, that's the south lunar node, which is where the moon crosses from north to south latitude, or north of the ecliptic to south of the ecliptic. North of the ecliptic in the northern hemisphere sky looks like it's above the ecliptic, and south looks like below. Okay, it's one of the reasons why I could see on this chart that though the moon appears to be eight degrees above the horizon, I could see that the moon is much closer to the horizon. And actually, what we saw in the points list here is it's right on the horizon. That's because the moon currently has south latitude, which I can see because the moon, when she got to Scorpio, crossed from the north to the south of the ecliptic plane. She got most south of the ecliptic plane when she squared the nodes at what's called the southern bending, 6 Aquarius. And here at 6 Pisces, still rather south of the ecliptic, which we saw here in Astro Gold Astrology Software, four and a third degree south of the ecliptic. So let's go back to this time in Stellarium at 7.30 a.m. I want to make sure by looking at the seconds that the clock has stopped, and it is. I'm going to go 7.30 zero and we will find that the moon is right on the ground right <clears throat> i think spacebar centers in on the object now i can zoom way in i can take the ground away h brings the horizon in and out we're going to see another place and look at that the center of the moon right on the ground zero degrees altitude just like we saw here in the points list of stellarium zero degrees altitude and again that even though stellarium shows the moon above the ground because that's what the horizontal line of an astrology chart is the horizon so we see the moon like eight degrees above the horizon but because the moon has southern latitude meaning where she is in her own orbital path that's the white circle now shown is south of the sun's path the ecliptic this means that in the northern hemisphere, southern latitude is going to rise after the zodiac degree. Let's go to our ecliptic grid that the celestial body projects to, right? See how Saturn is not on the ecliptic plane. There's Saturn's orbital path. I'm going to change that color. Um, Mercury's not on the ecliptic plane. There's Mercury's path. What we do to show the planetary position in the zodiac or celestial longitude is we draw perpendicular lines projecting that planet to the plane. All right, and so that's what's done here. Just realizing I have a student in a little bit, I don't think we're gonna make it through all of these menu options today. This might be sky and viewing options menu one. Let me take the ecliptic grid away. All right, so that's how you add the orbits of the planets, which is, I think, amazingly key. All right, so there's moon, and literally this way we can see the moon's nodes. Now, if you'll remember in the configuration windows in tools, there's topocentric coordinates, and that's looking with my feet on the Earth instead of from the center of the Earth, where actually the moon has not risen at this time. I can show you that here. If I turn on topo or parallax moon, which is topocentric experience of the moon, and then go back to the coordinates, let's see negative altitude, one degree below the horizon, okay? But in astrology, we tend to measure from the center of the earth, so I turn parallax off. And if I wanna mirror that in Stellarium, I need to turn off their default setting for topocentric coordinates, which we talked about some menus ago, because it's here in the tools, menu or sub menu of the configuration window menu. Now, importantly, look at when I do go topocentric, check out how the lunar nodes, okay, where the moon's path crosses the sun's path also changes. The astrology software doesn't do that. This astro gold software anyway, they change the position of the moon, but not the position of the moon's nodes. I, want, I mean to talk to them about that. 
Anyway, I'm going to stick with geocentric coordinates because usually when we're casting astrology charts, we're using geocentric or earth center coordinates because we are measuring in a sense or expressing our human experience of earth's experience of the heavens. Okay. When I unselected moon there, you see all the past showed up again. Let's click on Venus and now we'll see only Venus's path. It's like that. Okay. Um, back into the sky and viewing options menu. We were here in SSO or solar system objects. Show planetary nomenclature. That's interesting, but you know, I'm going to have to be so zoomed in on Venus for any of that to show up, I would assume. Let's go in there on Venus and there we see South Pole and these other things, which is cool. And that's because I have selected show special nomenclature points only let me unselect that and we have all these things named on venus all right so i'm going to unclick that i want to go use more accurate 3d models again that just seems to be default for the planets in stellarium so i'm just going to unclick that because the self-shadowing and all that seems to be default all right cool there's this button I keep going for, <laughs> but it's not set up yet, and I can't wait to bring us there, uh, which I think we'll find in this in these menus somewhere. Okay, so show trails. Well, that's an interesting thing. Let me turn the orbits off. I'm gonna unclick that. Venus's orbits off. Let me show. How do I want to do this? Let's show Mercury right now. Okay, I'm gonna click show trails. Let me take this menu away. Usually I do green for show trails. So I'm going to actually just click that and change that to green right now. Um, I mean, this gets pretty advanced into using Stellarium, not just the menu options, but I'm going to move through sidereal days and track Mercury's motion. Well, it's still yellow. <laughs> I thought I changed that to green, but there you go, right? I'm actually showing Mercury's path over many, many days. It's now April 11th on the clock. I'm going to click eight, seven to go back to now. And then we were using this 7.30 a.m. chart. Okay, back to function F4 brings me back to the sky and viewing options menu. It's weird that I said show trails and change it to green. Let me hit OK again there. And then click unclick show trails and they're gone. Let's click show trails. I'm going to put the menu away. Let me click on the sun and now I'll just, well, click on Mercury and now I'm just going to move through time. Oh, stopping time, making sure that that show trails is selected. Huh, maybe it's not going to show me trails through the day. I thought it did. Seemingly no. So let me go again in sidereal days. Yeah, so the green now took. How I'm moving through time, that's a keyboard shortcut. We're going to get into that later on when we talk keyboard shortcuts. Okay, the button eight to go to now, seven to stop time. Clicking back to 7.30 a.m., which is the chart I have elected. G to put the ground beneath my feet. I have to be clicked into the Stellarium screen for that keyboard shortcut to work. Function F4, taking trails away, and you saw that that just went away. Okay, um, next on our list, well, also show trails, and I, this is, let me increase the thickness of that trail, okay? Anytime you see like a, a menu like this next to it with a up and down and a number, it's increasing the thickness of the line. Only for N latest selected objects, maybe, oh, N would be a number. Oh, intriguing. Wow, cool. So I have that set to one right now, right? But let me go to three and let's click on, take the ground away. Let's click on Mercury, then on Venus, then on Jupiter. 
show trails is on. And then I'm going to go through days. Oops, wrong button. Wow, I've never seen that button before. <laughs> now they're all the same color and it would be nice. This is a Mercury retrograde and that's about to happen. It would be nice if, um, let's see this, this Z curve or S curve, that's a Mercury retrograde, one of the types of Mercury retrograde loop shapes that is made. It would be nice if I could use different colors for the different planets there. Um, I love that I can select more than one. Typically, I'm going to have that as one, but it's nice to know where I could go to do that. Actually, watch, look at that. I can change it real time. Well, they've gone away. Uh, no, so that's not true. I thought maybe I could go from the three to two to one, but it looks like they just kind of erased them and we'll start over. GRS details. Well, what is that? Custom settings for position of GRS. I don't know what G. Oh, isn't the geograph geological something survey. I don't know. See those plaques on the ground in special places around the world. What about solar system editor? Well, we already were here in our last video of finding how to add different minor bodies and whatnot or remove. So it doesn't seem like there's anywhere where I can set different colors for trails. And if I want to show the trails of multiple objects, it would certainly be nice if I could di differentiate them in any way. But look, amazing, huge, free program. I'm not complaining. All right, simulate light speed. I don't know what that's about personally. Sim limit magnitude, right? So we could go like if I crank this thing up um, or down, watch right here in the center of my circle on the left of your screen. As I come up, Uranus appears. So I go up further. If there were some asteroids on the screen, they would appear. Uranus is a naked eye object. So when Uranus first appears, Neptune's not going to be on there, okay? I'm probably not going to change that. But, you know, that's actually just me limiting the labels and markers, as you can see here. Limit magnitude would actually... Like, let me have Uranus up there. If I limit the magnitude, now Uranus actually just went away altogether. Okay, so if you wanted to stick with like naked eye planets and stop at Saturn, for example, there's going to be a place where you can set that. I'm going to stick with their default of 6.5. In fact, I don't even need a limit magnitude at all. Now Vesta came on, right? So watch Vesta here. That's an an asteroid in the asteroid belt candidate for a dwarf planet <laughs> according to the modern strange conventions but watch when i click limit magnitude vesta just went away now if i don't click limit magnitude vesta's there but if i change my slider vesta's label went away okay you can see that color box same trip if i change that the color that Stellarium is labeling the planets and other solar system objects like the asteroid Vesta uh, would change. Okay. Show the moon's halo. Well, look at that moon halo. Boom. <laughs> okay. I mean, that's kind of nice. The sun's glare and the sun's corona. Where is the sun? Let me go back to right now. Oh, I need to turn the show trails off. The trails were still green, by the way. Um, so here's sun. Let's see when we turn off the sun's glare. Sun's corona. Maybe that's... Uh, something for when the atmosphere is on. No, I'm just not seeing anything. Sun's glare with the atmosphere on. 
Yeah, that's kind of nice. You can actually just see the center of the sun. I didn't know about that. And this is obviously not our human experience, but sometimes to show and teach astrology it would be helpful for me to remember where I can turn that off. Okay, planet markers just draw circles around the planets, right? So let me show you turning that on and off. So you drew these circles around them. I don't really need that. Um, okay. Whew. Earth shadow enlargement after Dan John. Whoa. I'm leaving that off. But I think, well, let's try this. Um, let me turn the atmosphere on. Let me turn that earth shadow enlargement on. Put the ground beneath my feet with G. I'm rewinding time with J. Okay, as the sun is rising, you actually see Earth's shadow on the horizon opposite. Let me take the ground away to see that. I don't know. I'm guessing that's what's going on. Hey, by the way, our twinkle is certainly around now, isn't it? <laughs> so that was sky menu. Turn the twinkle off. All right, so maybe the twinkle is only during dusk and dawn. That's a lot of twinkle, y'all. I'm turning that down. Like a little twinkle for me. It's fun. Little twinkle. Twinkle. Giant star. I'm going point three. Okay. We're going to finish here in solar system objects, or maybe let's do deep sky objects today, too. Now, look, we can scale the moon. Let me get the moon over here. Sometimes this is really helpful for... I'm going to go through time. I actually want to let the, I'm going to wax the moon away from the sun a bit. Okay. So if I hit scale moon, you see what happens. The moon is much larger and I'm seeing the phase at all times, which is super convenient for teaching. And is actually something you actually see in the sky with your face. Now, one thing that annoys me here. Let me click scale planets too, and you're going to see Venus and Jupiter actually become, you know, interesting. Now, check out how Stellarium's labeling Venus, but not Jupiter. If I turn off the atmosphere, they're both going to be labeled. Stellarium does a decent job of labeling what actually you could see in the sky with your naked eye. Venus is tricky. You have to know where to look, but in certain phase angles from the sun venus is naked eye visible i've been initiated many many times now um the thing that annoys me is that if i do choose to increase the planets like i think i can go up to 500. oh i can go up higher than that let's try a thousand boom <laughs> right like it's kind of cool to see jupiter that huge obviously that's not going to be my naked eye experience of jupiter i think i have 500 set for when i want to show jupiter now this might be a time where self-shadowing might come into play. Nah, it's already there. I just don't know what that's about. Um, so I, I like showing these sometimes in this regard, like with the moon, maybe I'll even take her up higher. Here's moon at 10. And this is a time, by the way, when the moon is very close to one of her nodes. I could just tell because the moon's on the ecliptic. The moon's less on the ecliptic than she looks when I just blew her up to 10 times. So I'm going to unclick that box. And now we see the moon north of the ecliptic, okay? I'm not sure I'm loving moon's halo. I'm going back and forth on that. It's a personal thing, isn't it? So typically, if I'm going to show the planets in large like this, I'm going to take away their labels and markers and hope you know that that's Jupiter and that that's Venus or give you the opportunity to or usually if I'm doing this I'm narrating them anyway now when I make the moon large and I do like this kind of five times moon size without the planet labels box ticked I don't have that annoyance of times 500 now if I have them at normal size and I'm going to do that by unclicking these boxes before I do let me show you that you can also increase the size of the sun okay there's keyboard shortcuts for this that i like to turn on 
See with the sun increase. Let's see if that corona makes. Oh yeah, that now the corona, not only the glare, is making a difference. I see. So the sun's corona is kind of like this, the shine breaking away from the sides, where the glare is just this huge glare thing. <laughs> Very technical, Brett. Um, minor bodies, right? So we could find like an asteroid like Vesta and increase that too. Planets magnitude algorithm. So like the brightness of a planet looks like there's lots of different, I don't know, debate about how that works. Let's stick with that default. Did we make it through this menu? We did, and it's quite a menu. I'll feel like the markings menu is kind of the most important. Um, I'm gonna unclick all these scale size of and that earth shadow Dan John. I'd like to learn more about what that is another time. I wonder about leaving sun's corona but not glare. Uh, but I'm gonna keep all that on. So I'm gonna go before I leave here, configuration menu, main menu, save settings. And let's look at deep sky objects. I don't really use them. <laughs> so this is gonna just be really quick. Okay, labels and markers. And we can see all these like the summer rose star, helix nebula came on. Like they're super cool. If you're telescoping and learning your way around the sky in that regard, this is a wonderful menu. Okay, but for me, I just have them kind of default turned off. She's going to even unclick labels and markers and just leave it there. All right, in our next video, we will get through the markings, landscapes, sky cultures, and surveys. And um, I look forward to seeing you there. Until then, see you in space.